This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. As Miss Mary is making her way back to her seat, I will mention to you that we did get a letter in this week from one of the missionary families that we support on a monthly basis. Uh, this is the Hall family. They're missionaries to South Africa. They're planting churches there in South Africa and have been there for a number of years. Uh, but one of the projects they have been working on is trying to get a building built as a Bible college to train national pastors there. You know, one of the things missionaries, is, uh, missionaries are supposed to do is when they go to the foreign field, they're not only supposed to win people to Christ and baptize them and teach and preach there themselves, but the missionary is not going to be there for forever. You know, they're just like you and I. At some point, uh, they're not going to be able to keep doing what they're doing. And so their job is also to be training national pastors to do the work of the ministry as well. And so that's the purpose of the Bible College. And so they have completed the building there. Uh, Brother Hall said they still owe about $8,000 on it, so they still need to raise some money for that. So we might even talk about uh, sending uh, a little extra in addition to their regular support next month. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to leave this on the organ up here. And then if the uh, when the service is over this morning, if you want to come up and look at it, you're welcome to. And after the service is over this morning, I'll put it on our missionary prayer letter board over in the fellowship hall so you can see that t uh, tonight or Wednesday night if you'd like to. Brother Alex, I do appreciate you bringing me a cup of water for this morning because the pollen has done a number on me all week long this week. And I wasn't sure I was even going to have a voice this morning because long about Thursday this week, uh, I was moving my mouth, but there wasn't a lot of sound coming out. Uh, but I'm glad the Lord gave me my voice back in time for the Lord's day. And uh, so uh, I guess you can pray that it'll either hold out or won't hold out. I guess that'll depend on, that'll determine how long the message is this morning. But I'm so glad you're here. I want to share with you the message I feel like God has given me for this morning. Would you turn in your Bibles in the New Testament this morning to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. Now Paul's writings to the church of the Thessalonians is uh, his two letters to them are important because they give us a lot of information about the rapture of the church that is to come. That is the, the Lord appearing in the clouds to catch us up to be with Him and that begins the end times that we see in the rest of the New Testament. But the message this morning is not about the end times. It's not about the rapture. It is about our ability as individuals to come before God. And the reality is... Just about everybody you know, at least everyone who believes that there is a God, they would say that they would like the ability to be able to go to God from time to time for different things. It might be that they need something for themselves, maybe along the lines of physical needs, maybe along the lines of financial needs, maybe something else. Or it might be that they want to be able to go to God uh, to, to, to implore Him, to beg Him to do something on the behalf of someone else. But everyone who at least claims to believe in God would like to believe they have the, the right, the opportunity, the privilege to come before God when they need Him. And so I think there are a lot of people that have some misunderstandings about what it means to come before God who is allowed to come before God, and what those things are that we're allowed to ask, depending on whether we know Him personally or not. So I want to bring a message to you this morning entitled, Having Standing with God. 
Now, if you're able to, would you please stand with me this morning out of respect for God's Word as I read our text. It's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Here's what the Apostle Paul says, writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. Now I want to go back to verse 13. That's my primary text for the morning. We'll look at some other verses as we go along, but... Verse 13, Paul says, uh, To the end, He, that is Christ, may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. We all want to be able to come before God. But He is a holy God, a righteous God, and we as sinful creatures are anything but. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that for the next few minutes, Lord, that You would guide my mind and my heart, my mouth, Lord, that I would speak the things You want spoken this morning. Dear God, I pray that for every one of us that are here, whether it's the speaker or the hearers, that Lord, You would allow Your Spirit to control us. Lord, to put aside those other things, the busy things of the day and the week, Lord, that we might focus upon You and upon Your Word. Lord, I know that You have something special, particular for each person that is here this morning. Dear God, I pray that You'll deliver to them exactly the message they need at the moment in life where they find themselves today. For it's in Jesus' name and for His sake we ask it. Amen. And you may be seated. Yes, everyone talks about praying I guess there are a hundred different bumper stickers out there that you will see riding up and down the road. Pray for this, pray for that, uh, pray for America, and certainly we need to pray for America. Uh, You'll see bumper stickers on a regular basis. Uh, Pray for uh, the peace of Jerusalem, and certainly we ought to pray for those that are over there. Uh, I don't think any of us would want to be in the situation they're in today. Um, Pray for this, pray for that. There's so many different causes and people that need prayer. And it's almost that in American culture, it is kind of uh, too commonplace when people say, pray for this or pray for that. Because I'm afraid we live in a day and time where there's not a lot of real prayer that takes place in individuals' lives or in homes with families anymore or even in churches. We live in a time where people talk about prayer, but... Really, it's just some little light something we say when we're about to eat a meal or when we're about to lay our head on the pillow or if something really bad happens and all of a sudden we're in the middle of a strait between a rock and a hard place and we don't know what else to do, so we pull out prayer almost as a last resort. I'm afraid that's American culture and it is abused and misused. But the reality is we do all at least all of us who believe in God, we want to believe that we can go to God when we need to go to God. There's a story that Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 22, and it's several verses long, so if you want to turn there, you can, or you can just listen as I read it this morning. But in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is talking about those who are welcome before Him, and those that are not welcome before Him. It's actually one of a series of of stories and parables that Jesus tells in the Gospel of Matthew. And the main point that He's trying to get across in all of these stories that He tells is that there are some who, who will claim to believe on Him, claim that they belong to Him, but at the end of the day, He's going to say to them, Depart from me, I never knew you. Living in the day in which we live in America, again, I think there are a lot of people who call themselves Christians who are not, in fact, born again. They do not have a personal relationship with Him. 
And I'm afraid that's the, the group to which Jesus is addressing these several stories that He tells. But if you're there, I'm going to read beginning in Matthew 22, starting in verse 11, reading down through verse 14. Here's what Jesus says. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Now, this is a wedding feast that's taking place. It's a, a big, uh, big to-do, a wedding. And the master who has invited guests to come to the wedding, they were all given a special suit of clothes to wear for the special occasion. But here is someone who is there in the wedding party that doesn't have on the special garments that the wedding master has, has freely given to those that were invited. Look at verse 12. And he saith, saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now, I actually preached a message about two months ago on outer darkness. The Bible talks a good bit about outer darkness. That's not the focus of my message this morning, but the, the focus is this gentleman who showed up at the wedding without a wedding garment. He was clearly someone who was there who was not an invited guest. He thought he should be there. He thought he had a right to be there, else he wouldn't have been there. But he wasn't welcome there. Why? Because he didn't have the wedding garment like everyone else had. He didn't have a wedding garment because he wasn't on the list of invitees. Well, who's the one that made the list of invitees? The one who was throwing the wedding. Jesus is using this again to make the point that many are called, but few are chosen. For us to have standing before God, for us to have the right to come before God with anything, we have to have standing. We have to have the permission of God. Not just everyone who says, uh, God, I want you to do this for me, has a right to ask Him to do whatever it is. Not everyone who says, Lord, I want you to do this in my life or do this for my family member or do this for our country. No, God does not invite everyone to the wedding. It's not that everyone couldn't have come to the wedding, but He's the one who has determined who is welcome and who is not. We don't know a lot about this situation and this story, but the point Jesus is making is the man showed up wearing his own clothes instead of the clothes that God provided for him. The master of the wedding provided for him. And I'm afraid that there are too many people today that call themselves Christians, but they're expecting to go to the wedding party wearing their own best instead of God's best. You see, if we expect to go before a holy, righteous God wearing our own garments, we're going to be told the same thing that this man was at the wedding. Cast him into outer darkness. Because our own best is not good enough to come before a holy, righteous God. We have to have the righteousness of Christ ascribed to us, put on our account. And we have to put on the wedding garment that is the raiment that Christ has given to us, His righteousness, to be welcome to the wedding and to come before His presence. But let me get a little further along. Let me explain to you what I'm trying to get to this morning. I know the point might seem elementary, but it is a point that I think is being taken for granted by so many people that you and I know and that we see and, and deal with on a daily basis out and about in our everyday lives. The reality is that we who live here in the Bible Belt, among all places, 
we encounter a lot of people during the normal course of a week, and many of them, just because they grew up here in the Bible Belt, they know the words to use. They might have even gone to Sunday school as, as a boy or a girl. They know enough of the verbiage to use, but they don't have a relationship with Him. They don't have the relationship that is going to entitle them to come before God. And let's face it, at some point, we're all going to need to come to God for something. I'm not just talking about our salvation. We all need that. But even in the mundane existence of this life, we all need other things from God as well. I'll be honest with you, I don't know what those folks do who get up every day and go through the course of a day not knowing what the day holds without knowing Him. I would not want that existence for myself. I wouldn't want that existence for my family. I don't want that existence for you. This world has so many uncertainties even in this life. To walk through it alone is not uh, a happy prospect. But to come before a holy, righteous God, we have to have standing. You say, preacher, what is standing? Does that just mean standing up? No, that's not what I'm talking about. You, if, you're, if you've ever been to court, you probably know what standing is. Standing in a court is the, uh, the right to come before the judge... And if you have standing, that means, number one, the matter pertains to you personally. You have a vested interest in whatever's going on. And number two, you are under the jurisdiction of that court. If you go to court and you try to sue somebody in court, and lo and behold, you are out of the court's jurisdiction, or that person lives out of the court's jurisdiction, and the judge is going to say, I'm sorry, but you don't have the standing to bring your case to the court. Case dismissed. Go file it somewhere else. If we want to come before God, we have to have standing before Him. And in this sense, it's not really standing as in standing before a judge in a court, though Jesus is the judge, but having standing before Jesus is having standing before the King. Because He is not only the judge, He is the King as well. He is prophet and priest and king. He is the judge. My mind thinks back to my world history days in 10th grade. You know, in ancient times, if someone wanted to go in before the king, you didn't just walk in before the king and show up uninvited before the king. You had to receive permission to come in before the king. That is, you had to have standing to come before the king. If you remember the story of Esther that's in our Bibles, Esther was the queen. But even as the queen, she was not entitled to go in before the king without his consent, without his permission, without having standing to come. And she was worried about whether she should go before the king, Ahasuerus, with the, the tragic news of, of what Haman was trying to do to, to destroy the, the people of, of God, the Jews, her people. But she went before the king. She broke the rule by going before the king. I just want to tell you that Queen Esther fared very well going before King Ahasuerus. He could have had her, the queen, beheaded right on the spot or banished, dethroned from being the queen. Any number of those things he could have done because she came before the king without standing. Dear friends, please don't us think that we're going to come before a holy, righteous God without having the right standing to, to do so. Christians in... 21st century America are a little too casual, a little too flippant about approaching God. You see this in the way people 
even those who call themselves Christians sometimes show up for church. I'm not talking about people that just had knee replacement surgeries, but, but you'll see people that will just show up to worship God wearing sandals, flip-flops, and, and a t-shirt like they were showing up for the beach party. There are plenty of those kind of churches that invite people to dress that way when they come to the house of God. And I don't suppose it's as important in, uh, in how you come as in how you leave. But if you're telling people it's okay to come to the house of God, come to worship God in that kind of a casual attitude, that's no way to approach God. That's no way to worship God. And I'm not saying that God cares what you have on. I think you can worship God wearing sandals, flip-flops, shorts, and a, a, a t-shirt on the beach. I think you can worship God just fine that way. But it's the attitude of the heart. It's a reflection of what is in the heart. I think we see the same thing in the lives of Christians who, just like the lost people they go to work with, go to school with, they'll take the, the Lord's name in vain. They'll tell a, dirt, a dirty joke. We, as God's people, we ought to approach the throne of God like we're approaching the throne of a king. And not just any king, but the King of kings and Lord of lords. All of you that are here know that uh, the preacher, you, you know who I'm going to vote for in this upcoming election. I think he's a lot better than the other choice, but I would much, much rather go into my prayer closet at home and get along with God than go have lunch with Mr. Trump. He's the creator of the universe. He's also the one who loved me enough that He gave Himself for me. He not only owns me because He made me, but He owns me because He redeemed me and bought me back. He loved me that much. And when I approach to a holy God who loves me in that way, how foolish it would be, how disrespectful it would be to approach Him any way other than than with a clean heart. Viewing myself the way He views me. Not arrogant. Not as though this is just a flippant moment. But that's what true worship is. Jesus is the King. He is the Judge. There are people that have a lot of different things they're counting on to give them that standing to come before God. I'm not going to try to list them all this morning. You could list as many as I could or more, but just a few of them. Some of the people that feel like they have a right to come to God when they need something, it's because, hey, my family have been Christians since I don't know when. My mom and daddy were saved. My grandma and grandpa were saved on both sides of the family. I have a right to come before God. I grew up in a Christian home. But dear friends, that's not standing for you. That might be standing for mama and daddy. It might be the standing good enough for grandma and grandpa if they were the ones that were saved. But unless you are saved, you have no right to come before God. There's some who rely on their baptism. Whether they were baptized as a baby or baptized as an adult. There are some people who think that because they've been baptized, they're saved. You know, I, I witness to people on a regular basis. And there are numerous times that in witnessing to someone, when I ask them the question, do, do you know for sure? that if something happened and you died today, that you'd go to heaven, do you know for sure? A lot of times people will say, well, I think so. And then I'll ask them, you know, why, why do you think so? What is it that you are basing that on? Uh, or the question I normally use, 
If somebody asked you what they would have to do to be saved, what would you tell them they'd have to do? And too many times someone will respond with the answer, well, when I was little, I got baptized. Well, friends, we should get baptized, but baptism comes after salvation. Not before salvation. It's not part of salvation. It comes after salvation. And the reality is there are a lot of preachers that are to blame for the misunderstanding. Because there are more than a few preachers across the land who have given people the impression that water baptism saves a person or in some way helps save a person. That is not the case. We get saved and then we get baptized. It's the same as Abraham when he came before the Lord. The Bible says of Abraham in Romans chapter 4, was he, God asks the rhetorical question through the Apostle Paul, was he saved? Was Abraham saved uh, when he was circumcised or before he was circumcised? And then, as you've heard me say many times, I'm so glad Paul didn't leave that rhetorical question unanswered. He answered it for us. Otherwise, there'd be a lot more people confused than there are. But Paul answered it. He said, no, Abraham was not saved by his circumcision. He was saved before his circumcision. And then Paul goes on to say, he believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. It is by grace through faith and faith alone that a person is born again. Someone's baptism is not going to give them standing before God. It doesn't even matter if their name is on the church roll because they got baptized and the church counted it. If they've not been born again, being baptized or having your name on the church roll is not going to give you standing before God. There are those who think that because they're as good as the next person, that's going to give them standing before God. A lot of times, again, in witnessing, when I ask someone, do you you know for sure if you died today you'd go to heaven? And they say, well, I, I think so. And I ask them why they think so. A lot of times they'll say something like this. You've probably heard people say this too. They'll say something along the lines of, well, uh, I'm better than so and so. Or I'm not that bad of a person. Perhaps you've heard people say that. They're comparing themselves with someone else. Paul tells us in the New Testament that's unwise to compare ourselves with ourselves. We're supposed to be compared to the standard of holiness, of a holy, righteous God. And I'm afraid we all come up short in that measurement. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. And if our if our hope of our standing is that we're better than a lot of other folks, that's not going to give us standing before God. There are some also who claim to believe in salvation by grace through faith, like I just said, and yet they don't. Preacher, what do you mean by that? Can I tell you that probably the majority of churches within a 10-mile radius of right here would tell you from the pulpit that they believe that someone is saved by grace through faith. But then they will go on to tell tell those same people sitting in the pews in their churches that they could then lose their salvation. Wait a minute. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So if a preacher is preaching to people, all you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, but make sure you do right after you get saved or you can end up losing it, Wait a minute, that's giving a false gospel. That's a different gospel. That's that's faith plus what I do, which is not faith at all. 
It has to be completely faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and His finished work on Calvary, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Faith in that and that alone to save my soul or it's not faith at all. That's right. Amen. But it is the truth. I sincerely believe it that the majority of churches around us and all across America are preaching, yes, we believe in salvation by grace through faith, uh, pray and, and believe that Jesus died for your sins on the cross. But if you don't do right, if you do such and such, or if you do enough such and such, you'll lose your salvation. That's not the same gospel. And if I get saved or think I'm getting saved by believing on Jesus, but at the same time, I think I can lose my salvation. I'm not putting all my faith and trust in Him to do the saving in the first place. And I know that your preacher probably talks about this more than I talk about any other thing, and it's not because I don't like any preacher or any church. It's because I think this is the biggest thing preachers have done to confuse people in our generation. And I am afraid that the majority of people that you and I meet every week out and about that say they're Christians are not even born again. Preacher, that's a little arrogant to say. Preacher, you're saying that just because you think you're the only one that's right. No, I promise I don't think that. I don't think I'm the only preacher that's right. I don't think Pinnacle Baptist is the only church that's right. I don't even think you have to be a Baptist. You'd be hard-pressed to find another Bible-believing church that's not Baptist, but I know a few, and you might too. But if someone gets saved or thinks they're getting saved, believing they can then lose it based on what they do, they haven't put 100% of their faith in Christ to do the saving. And if I don't say that from this pulpit, who else is going to say that? You're not going to hear it on the radio. You're not going to hear it on television. You're sure not going to hear it from any of that crowd in Washington. You're not going to see it on the big screen in all these pop culture so-called Christian movies that are out from Hollywood. No, they're, they're fine with you believing that other gospel. As long as you call yourself a Christian and just feel like you're part of the club. That's not what I'm called to do. I'm called as a a preacher of the gospel to tell the truth. And there's a lot more people sitting in that big church five minutes down the road with the big glass chandeliers this morning than there are sitting right here in, in my pews, in Pinnacle Baptist Church, in my flock. I understand that. But whether it's popular or not is the truth. And you and I have to understand it, first of all, so that we might be saved. And secondly of all, so that we can share the gospel with those around us that are lost. I'm just going to be frank with you for a minute. This isn't in my notes. I'm just talking to you because that's, that's what I want to do this morning. You and I don't do the job of witnessing like we ought to. Part of it is because we're all a little bit shy by nature, or a lot of us are. We get a little timid about talking to people, especially about important things. I mean, we've all been brainwashed into believing that the two things you're not supposed to talk about are politics and religion. When in reality, those are probably the two most important things we ought to be talking about because they're tearing our country apart. But the other reason I think we don't witness like we ought to is because when someone tells us they're a Christian, we just leave it at that and move on. Without knowing what do they mean when they say, I'm a Christian. I assure you that the majority of people driving up and down that road out there do not mean the same thing you and I mean when they say, I'm a Christian. And there's no other way but to ask them, well, 
You know, what does a person have to do to become a Christian? Or, or if you know them well enough, you know, have a longer conversation. But we've, at some point, we've got to find out, do they actually understand that it means putting 100% of your faith and trust in Him to do the saving? And not trusting partly myself, my own works. I mean, we've got to get to that crux to know if they're genuinely born again or not. And I'm not saying you have to do that right out of the chute. I'm not saying you have to do it the first conversation you have with anybody. But if we don't ask that some way or another, we're never going to know if they're truly born again or not. And when they come before a holy God, they're going to show up thinking they have standing to come before God... And it's going to be the preacher's fault that told them that lie. But it's also going to be my fault and your fault for not sharing the truth with them when we could have. And that day when they look flabbergasted, well, I, thought, I, I, I thought I would have standing too. Or they say the same thing those in the gospel said, um, you know, Lord, did, did not we uh, prophesy in thy name? Did not we cast out devils in thy name? Did not we do this and that? Go to the, the soup kitchen and, and help people? Uh, did, did we not give, uh, give money to the poor people? Did we not fit, uh, fill a shoebox at Christmas time to send to children overseas? Did we not do all those things in your name, Lord? And he's going to say the same thing Jesus said in the Gospels. Depart from me, I never knew you. Because they think they have standing to come before God, but if they're not truly born again, they don't have standing. And not just standing for salvation, but standing for all those other prayers you and I want to ask Him on a regular basis. Whether it's because, Lord, our family has a problem going on. Lord, we need Your help in our family. Or Lord, we've got this, this health need. Lord, please, please intervene on our behalf. Listen, if we don't belong to Him, we have no right to come before Him. But He knows His own. He recognizes His own. If we're truly born again, we are citizens of His kingdom. Citizens of heaven. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 11, verse 15 and 16 say. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. That's talking about those Old Testament believers that are being, being mentioned in Hebrews 11. But it's talking about us too, that have believed on Him by faith. He's not ashamed to be called our God. Why? Because we're citizens of heaven. You have your citizenship there, therefore you have a right to come before the King. And not only are you a citizen of heaven, but you're a child of the King Himself. A child of the King Himself. In Romans chapter 8, which is one of the most beautiful chapters in all the Bible, it, it tells us that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. Now you and I are not the begotten sons of God. We're not natural born sons and daughters like Jesus is. We're adopted sons and daughters. But the great news is that God doesn't treat adopted sons and daughters any differently than He treats His natural born son. We are children of the King. Well, yes, the King might have other people summarily executed for coming in because they don't have standing. But is the King going to execute His own son or daughter for coming in before Him to ask Him a question? No, the King is not going to do that. The children of the king have special access to the king. He's their father. They're his children. 
So to have standing, we have to know Him personally. That makes us citizens of heaven, which gives us standing. It makes us children of the King, which gives us standing. So what does someone do to gain that position as a child, as a citizen? To gain that standing. What do we have to do to be able to bring those requests to Him? I've already said that strangers have no right to petition Him. In fact, the only petition of the lost that God entertains is when a lost person throws themselves on the mercy of the court and says the same thing that the publican said to to Jesus in the New Testament. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the only prayer, that's the only petition that God hears from a lost person. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Don't start asking God for all those other things you want Him to do for you if you're not even His own. The only thing you can uh, have a right to ask of Him uh, up to that point is, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And until you're born into the family of God, you don't have standing to ask Him anything else. You must be born again first. I'm going to go a little bit off to the side for just a minute to deal with a question that I've had lots of parents ask me over the years. I've had lots of parents that ask me, well, Pastor, if we're only supposed to pray to God once we're saved, does that mean we shouldn't teach our children to pray even when they're little bitty bitty? No, that's not the case at all. Let me explain the difference. When a child is little and doesn't know the difference between right and wrong, they're just the same Adam and Eve were in the garden. They're not holy, but they're innocent. They don't know the difference. So the best thing you can do for them is to teach them to pray so they become comfortable talking to God. So that when they reach the point they do know the difference, it'll be no big thing for them to go to their heavenly Father and ask Him to save their soul. You see, before Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, they were in that innocent stage as well, but God spoke to them in the cool of the day every day in the Garden of Eden. The Bible says He walked with them in the cool of the day and talked with them every day. That's why the day that they sinned and He showed up to talk with them in the cool of the day, they were hiding. Because that was a regular routine that He talked with them. They talked with Him. So yes, When your children are little, teach them to pray. Let them know that God loves them, cares about them, cares about their prayers. But at some point, they get old enough that they begin to know the difference between right and wrong. And that's when you have the perfect teaching opportunity to say, you know what? When someone begins to understand the difference between right and wrong, that's when they need to ask Jesus to be their Savior. And it opens the door for parents to share Christ with their children. So yes, teach your children to pray when they're little. Because they're in that innocent stage. If they don't learn to pray then, it's going to be a lot harder to teach them to pray when they get older. But a lost person has no standing before God. You must be saved. You must be brought into the family of God. Colossians 1.13 says that we are translated into His kingdom. Listen to what the Bible says. Colossians 1.13 Who, that is Jesus, hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. You are translated into His kingdom. That is, you become a citizen of His kingdom. In Romans chapter 4, again, Paul talking about Abraham, he said this, "...and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, that is what God had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to Abraham for righteousness." Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, 
but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on Him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. The Bible says when we believe on Jesus, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to our account. Preacher, I have no idea what the word imputed means. Well, it's definitely not a word we use very often. And when it is used nowadays, it's used mainly in legal terms. But to impute something means to ascribe something to someone else. To put something uh, from this person's account onto this person's account. When we, by faith, believe Him, the righteousness of Christ is put on our account. It's imputed to our account. And we're clothed with His righteousness. Listen to what Revelation chapter 3 says, beginning in verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out His name out of the book of life. But I will confess His name before my Father and before His angels. And then in Revelation 19, 14 And the armies which were in heaven followed Him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Friends, that white raiment, that white linen in which believers are clothed is the righteousness of Christ. It's not my good works. It's the righteousness of Christ. Isaiah said that even our good works are as filthy rags before the Lord. That's our good works. We must be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. So preacher, what's the, what's the point of all this today? Well, the point of this is that, number one, there are a lot of people that are just not born again. And they have no standing, no right to come before God because they're not yet part of His family. They're not yet citizens of heaven. And you and I have an obligation to share Christ with them more than we do. But the second part and my final final point for today is that you and I who are saved, that are born again, you don't have to beg for permission to come before God. If you are His child, you don't have to beg permission. You can come boldly to the throne of grace. Hebrews 4.16 says that very thing. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Oh, dear friends, there have been many times in my Christian life that I needed to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If you've been saved any amount of time at all, you've undoubtedly had some of those times as well. If you haven't, Hold on, those days are coming. But if you know Him as your Savior, you do have standing. And you don't have to beg for permission to go before the King. You can go and pour your heart out any time before God. I know that was a lot of preaching to get one little point across. But the reality is our society in spite of the fact it's, a, it's an elementary point, our society has missed it. And if you and I don't help them to see it, they're going to go before God one day and wonder why they're being cast into outer darkness. You and I have an obligation to them. We ought to pray that God would give us a burden for souls, a compassion for the lost, Let us not ever think in any way in an arrogant mind that we're better than anyone else. We're just more blessed and we need to share that with others. Would you stand quietly and reverently to your feet please with heads bowed and eyes closed. Miss Mary, if you'll come to the piano. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray Lord that you take the message. Lord, if there's anyone here today or listening later on that do not know for sure that if they die today, they go to heaven. Oh, dear Lord, please, please, Lord, may they see the need to be saved today. May they not put it off any longer, but be saved today. 
And then, Lord, for all the folks that have listened that are already saved. Oh, dear Lord, I pray this message would be a message of encouragement and hope that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Lord, any time we may, be, we may come boldly to the throne of grace. Help that to encourage my folks today, dear Lord. They can ask you for anything. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray within your will. Lord, I pray that you'd bless my folks. They're good folks. They love you. They want to be used of you. Use us and bless us and protect us, I pray. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around, Miss Mary, whenever you're ready, if you'll just begin to play.